So today uh, I will talk about the reticular formation. Uh, you could see on the on the list uh, of topics that there is no such topic itself by itself, but you can use the information to a lot of questions. And as you already saw by the descending pathways of the spinal cord, for example, the reticulospinal tract or the rough spinal tract. Uh, and uh, there are many other questions where uh, something about the reticular formation can be asked. Uh, so as the name suggests, and that's why I chose this uh, picture, it's a reticular, a network system. Reticular means network. Think about the reticular um, connective tissue, for example, the network of reticular fibers and cells. So this is a network and a very, very diffuse and complex network, the reticular formation. So it means, as I said, a network like the neuronal system in the brainstem, in all parts of the brainstem, so medulla uh, to mesencephalon. And the red little dots here indicate the reticular formation nuclei. So here we have smaller and bigger nuclear complexes between the known pathways and the cranial nerve and other big nuclei like gracilis and cuneate nuclei. So whatever is not occupied by these other nuclei uh, and or pathways. So basically the entire brainstem tegmentum, gray matter, which does not belong to cranial nerve nuclei or other big nuclei, is the reticular formation. Uh, so, uh, as I said, it has very diffuse connections, very diffuse, very complex, and is a very ancient system in phylogenesis. It filters input and regulates output, which you will understand at the end uh, or soon uh, what it exactly means. I will explain it. So let's see the neural connections first. So here you can see a few neurons drawn uh, with very long processes. And through these long processes, almost all parts of the CNS can be arrived. So basically you can list any part of the central nervous system. You can be sure that there is a reticular formation connection. So as a student, you can use the reticular formation as a jolly joker. You can put any reticular something and something reticular together, you can be almost 100% sure that it exists as a pathway. So when we are still asking, and what else, and what else is it connected to, you can always say reticular formation. And uh, here you can also see that it has very diffuse connections. The, the whole CNS is uh, actually uh, woven through by, by uh, reticular formation pathways. Uh, anatomically, it can be divided into three longitudinal zones, one directly next to the midline, which is called median zone, pink, and uh, medial zone. So these are two different zones. Don't uh, mix median with medial. The median zone is also called rough nuclei or rough zone because it's directly next to the midline, like a rough. And this is what you will hear a lot in uh, physiology too, the rough and nuclei. And then the medial zone and the lateral zone. The uh, median zone, the rough and nuclei work mainly with serotonin. We don't ask these uh, B and other uh, with letter indicated nuclei. I just uh, show it because in many books, especially in physiology, you can find these uh, name, so you know where to locate them. These are called the B uh, nuclei 1 to 9, but you don't have to know which are found in the medulla pons and mesencephalon. But you have to know rough nuclei with serotonin. The medial zone here with purple has big cells. That's why it's also called uh, gigantocellular nuclei. And this is basically the efferent system of the, the main efferent system of the reticular formation where most ascending and descending pathways begin. For example, the one I already mentioned last time at the descending pathways of the spinal cord, the reticulospinal tracts. 
and the lateral zone has smaller neurons, more diffuse connections with many cranial nuclei and other nuclei in the brainstem and not only brainstem. So it, it's mainly a, an association center where many different uh, sources of information are connected with each other. They also work with different transmitters, noradrenaline, adrenaline, acetylcholine. This, uh, these pictures you can find in textbooks and with many different names. You don't have to learn the names. I will show you the ones you do have to know. Okay, so please don't learn all these names. These are all, of course, important, but we don't have to know all of them by name. So uh, there are many different nuclei with different names, different groupings, according to which book you read. You don't have to know this. I will show you the ones you have to know. So let's see uh, the transmitters, the main transmitters and modulators. So the two most common, commonly occurring transmitter, glutamate as the main excitatory, and GABA is the main inhibitor transmitter here also occur, of course. But beside these, we have the so-called uh, monoamine transmitters, which are derivatives of amino acids like dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, adrenaline or epinephrine, uh, and many other peptides which modulate the information. Here you can see a few uh, pictures on the anatomical connections, like monoaminergic uh, pathways, first the noradrenaline. Here you can see one nucleus that you do have to know by name, the locus ceruleus. Locus ceruleus is a blue spot in the rhomboid fossa. When you learn the rhomboid fossa, you can see that it's usually uh, indicated as a darker spot or bluish dark spot. And this is what the name says. Locus ceruleus means blue spot. So uh, this is where we have the main noradrenergic pathways beginning. Here you can see this as a center in this picture. And you can see that there are descending and ascending pathways basically to many, many parts, almost all parts of the central nervous system and also to the cerebellum. So this is what uh, determines, for example, wakefulness, attention, this is a very important pathway. You will understand at the end of the lecture uh, that this whole system is very important in waking up the cortex. So uh, wakefulness, alertness, attention uh, is, is almost everywhere indicated uh, as a main, uh, main function. The other uh, very important uh, transmitter in this system is serotonin and the serotoninergic pathways. It's a little bit on the other side, mainly in sleep, depression is important, depressing functions, body functions, and uh, also in pain, you will see at the end. Here, you also have to learn one nucleus, which is here in the medulla. This is the nucleus rafa magnus. The nucleus rafa magnus, is the biggest, as the name tells you, the biggest rough nucleus. So it's in the uh, midline zone. And here you can see that from these rough nuclei also, we have basically the entire central nervous system uh, reached with descending pathways, rough spinal tract. I will show you at the end why it's very important, the rough spinal tract. <coughs> and then cerebellum, cortex, um, cephalon, so many parts of the central nervous system. Then the uh, other two main uh, transmitters, the dopamine and uh, acetylcholine, you can see that the, their connections are more localized. We will talk a lot more about dopaminergic pathways when we do the basal ganglia, basal ganglia for uh, the motor functions. But this, uh, the dopaminergic connections of the reticular formation have many other uh, important functions for cognitive uh, cognition, reward. Reward is a very important human function, not only human, of course. So you reward yourself with something. When you do something that you like, you get reward. So you feel good. This is this 
uh, internal reward system, which is very important. And the main transmitter in this system is dopamine. And then cholinergic pathways, you can see, are also more localized. And this is a very important system in cognition, memory, learning. And this is the system that first uh, gets degenerated in, in Alzheimer's disease. So no wonder Alzheimer's disease, the leading problem is cognitive problem. So more important uh, for you at this moment than the, uh, the anatomical distribution of the nuclei is the functional centers. And the very famous physiologist said that no animal can fight, go to sleep, run away, make love all at once. We cannot do everything all at once. This is logical, you know that. Uh, so we have to choose. Our system, our body has to choose what is in this moment important for my survival. Uh, now try to think a little bit not like humans, so or uh, in a human scenario, but uh, more primitive animals. Uh, when they, for example, run away, or they, they find food, or they go to sleep, they have to choose what is important for them in this moment for survival. So this is a very important center to integrate the incoming information and based on this information to decide what the body has to do, what the nervous system has to regulate, what we have to do. So it integrates and coordinates very important physiological functions and also determines when we go to sleep and when we wake up. So this whole sleep-wake cycle is very important and it's mainly done in the particular formation. You know, we are awake when our cortex is awake and uh, the cortex gets always information from the reticular formation uh, and will be activated by the reticular formation. Then very important physiological centers, cardiovascular, respiratory, uh, important physiological reflexes, vomiting, swallowing, coughing, chewing, suckling, sneezing, micturition, all these important physiological reflexes are centered in the reticular formation. So there in physiology, you will hear it all the time that the reticular formation is uh, the center. Then eye movements, you already heard the lectures on eye movements. Eye movements are also coordinated by the reticular formation centers, the PPRF, the mesencephalic center, etc. These are all reticular formation centers. What we discuss in detail today are these six functions, the ARAS, vomiting, respiratory, cardiovascular, motor, and the pain uh, centers. Of course, there are many other centers you will uh, hear in physiology in detail. So we go according to this order. So we begin with ARAS. What ARAS, what does it mean? Uh, it's an abbreviation for S ascending reticular activating system, ARAS. Uh, when we have a real lecture, I usually turn off the light and start talking about something really boring like this, that they're rough and close. So very monotone uh, way. And then people can understand it better, but of course you get the idea like this as well, that if there are monotonous stimuli, like darkness, boring lecture, uh, monotonous voice, um, etc., then you fall asleep very easily, right? Because the stimuli are monotonous. You don't feel how important it is for your survival in this moment. But if I say uh, in this darkness and monotonous, uh, uh, I, I break the monotonous uh, stimuli with saying that yeah, Dr. Reka, she will definitely ask this in the final exam of neuroanatomy. Then your system gets alarmed. You get alarmed because you know that this is really important for your survival. So your whole body wakes up. And this is very simplified, really, the, uh, the, the function of the reticular formation to wake you up. And uh, now, of course, it's even... Uh, more deactivated this system uh, in online lectures. I'm sure that half of you are in one of these positions at this moment. Uh, and um, 
because the stimuli are even more monotonous. You don't have so many visual stimuli, you only see your screen, uh, etc. So this is, this is uh, uh, much lower the activity of this activating system. So it's even easier to fall asleep uh, during an online lecture. So ARAS is the prerequisite for attention and consciousness. You know, whatever we, uh, doesn't reach our cortex, we don't know about. So for being conscious, for being uh, awake, actually, you need to wake up your cortex. And this is done, uh, as it is shown by this very simplified drawing, by this network, which then through the thalamus activates the cortex. When you, when you hear the lecture on the thalamus, you will understand thalamus is also called gate for consciousness. So all the information reach our cortex through the thalamus. So we influence the cortex through the thalamus from the reticular formation. So you can see that afferents to this system can come from anywhere and everywhere because all the information that is that can wake us up we reach the reticular formation. So it can come from anywhere. I will show you further examples. And then the efferents go via thalamus to the entire cortex, a diffuse connection. And this exercise is actually a very useful exercise that you can try right now too. If you want to understand really what the reticular formation does, then think of all consciously Think of all the information that reach you at this moment. So uh, visual, and it's uh, of course in a, in a real lecture is even more stimuli. Visual, what do you see on your screen? What do you see in your room? Uh, all around, who else do you see? What, uh, what are the light conditions? Everything, all visual information. All auditory, not only my speech, but may, uh, the noises from the street, from the room, from the neighbor, uh, etc. So all the auditory information. Then vestibular, you are sitting, you are standing, you are lying. So what is your head position, etc. Somatosensory, temperature. What is the temperature in the room? Uh, you remember we talked about the uh, somatosensory information, pain, touch. Uh, crude touch. You are sitting, then your gluteal region uh, touches the, the chair. You are holding the computer. You are uh, putting your finger on, your, on the mouth. You have clothes on. So think about all the clothes you have uh, on, what touches where your skin, uh, glasses, etc. A visceral, uh, sorry for the somatosensory, also the proprioceptive information. Your knee joint is in which position, your finger joints in which position, etc. Your muscles are stretched or relaxed, uh, stretched or um, uh, contracted. So all this information from every single muscle. Then visceral sensory. You, you are hungry, you have just eaten, uh, you are thirsty, you have to go to the bathroom. Uh, you have stomach pain, a headache, all this visceral sensory information. Smell, all the olfactory stimuli. And plus, many, many things from the cortex. You are listening to this lecture because you, you, you are going to do neuroanatomy exam. So all this conscious information reach the, the reticular formation. What would happen if the reticular formation didn't do this filtering function. And you would have, that your cortex would be overloaded by all this information that you don't need. You don't need uh, the whole day to know exactly which cubic millimeter is touched by which one of your clothes. You don't need consciously to know about the temperature all the time. You don't need this information, right? Uh, you would go crazy, literally. You would go crazy if your cortex had to analyze every single moment, all this that I just listed. So this is exactly the function of the reticular formation to filter the monotonous stimuli that are not important for our survival. Once you stood up, because you changed 
the position or you sit down, you, you can feel that you are sitting on a chair, but then from that moment on, you don't need, it's not changed, you don't need this information. So when it becomes monotonous, the, it's not changed, uh, the reticular formation filters this out. This is what it means, filters input, because it doesn't need to send it on to the cortex. And if you, if you turn it uh, upside down, you can also think of all the stimuli that can wake us up. So what, uh, whatever breaks this monotony can wake us up. It can be auditory, an alarm clock, it can be visual, uh, the sun is shining through our window, it can be somatosensory, I, uh, somebody <laughs> shakes you, it can be viscerosensory, you become hungry, you have to go to, to the toilet. Uh, so anything that breaks this monotony can wake you up. Because when this system is, uh, uh, is uh, down, then you can go to sleep, right? So when uh, the monotonous stimuli make you sleepy because uh, uh, the cortex is not alarmed, so to say. So this is how this system is really important in the sleep-wake cycle and consciousness, attention and alertness. And of course, clinically, uh, things... Uh, things can go wrong in both ways. So if a system is hypoactive or inactive, we have a problem, or if a system is hyperactive, we have a problem. So in both cases, uh, both cases occur with the RS. If you understood what I said so far, uh, that this is the prerequisite for consciousness and attention, if the system is not working well, hypoactive or inactive, then uh, the cortex is not awake. We are in coma or we have uh, uh, consciousness problems. So uh, this can happen uh, in reticular formation lesion as well. Not only, of course, cortical lesion or diencephalic lesion can lead to coma, but this can happen in uh, reticular formation lesion too, especially if it happens in, in the upper part. We will soon have the cardiovascular and respiratory centers, and you will see that they are in the lower part of the brainstem. So if this happens in the upper part, uh, patients can stay year, years long in, um, in coma because the basic uh, autonomic functions uh, like cardiovascular respiratory are intact. So this, this can lead to, to many years in coma. Or the other way around, if the system is too active, too active meaning exactly what I said here. If the system is always sending, the, activating the cortex about every little detail, whether we need it or not, so the, the monotonous stimuli are not filtered out, then exactly this happens, what I said, all the time, every little thing is uh, distracting us, and this is, um, uh, this can lead to this hyperactivity disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Uh, the problem, we don't know the exact problem in the background. We don't know the exact mechanism. But this is one of the uh, suspected mechanisms that there are abnormal circuits, neuronal circuits in this system, and then exactly this exercise, what I described, happens. You, you, you can't concentrate on one thing because every little change of the sunlight, every little thing distracts these uh, people. And this, uh, this is uh, nowadays even more common. Uh, it's more commonly diagnosed. We know about this disease. But many children have problems uh, paying attention in school. And some of them, not all of them, of course, with attention uh, problem, but some of them have really this disorder, but too many things dis distracts them. They cannot concentrate on one thing. So this can be one of the, uh, the reasons. Okay, let's go to our next main function, which is the vomiting, vomiting center. Uh, this is the so-called aria postrema. You will soon learn the rhomboid fossa in the brainstem. Rhomboid fossa is in the pons and in the medulla, the rhomboid fossa. And uh, this is in the, in the most caudal end of the rhomboid fossa, the so-called aria postrema. Uh, so it's embedded actually in the floor of the fourth ventricle. 
and it belongs to the so-called circumventricular system. Circumventricular is around the ventricles, ventricles, and here we have a few spots where there is no blood-brain barrier. You learned about the blood-brain barrier. You learned that almost every part of the central nervous system is actually closed off from the surrounding by the blood-brain barrier. And uh, we have a few spots where exactly uh, the main thing is to feel what is in the blood, to sense what is in the blood, and vomiting center is one of them. And here there is no blood-brain barrier. Maybe this is the most well-known such area. And this can be asked, for example, even in, histo in the histology part of the final exam when you have the astrocyte slides and you talk about the blood-brain barrier. This can be a question, do you know any areas where there is no blood-brain barrier? And this is the most well-known, so you can mention the area postrema, the vomiting center. Usually when we describe a reflex, uh, we start with the afferent and then go to the efferent part. Here I make it reverse because the efferent part you already know. Of course, you learned uh, the stomach and you know how the efferent uh, part, the executive part of the uh, vomiting happens. And um, uh, it's, it's done by the vagus nerve. So uh, the two most important, uh, not too much, the, the two important uh, uh, nuclei in this sense, the nucleus of the solitary tract and the dorsal vagal nucleus, and then uh, at the end the cardia opens and you throw up. And before what you feel, the nausea, this is exactly this whole system being uh, alarmed, and also the aria uh, postrema. So let's see now the different stimuli that can activate the system. Uh, we have five, five main points. Four of them, you can, uh, you can just guess by common sense. Everybody has already thrown up. Everybody has seen people thrown up, throwing up. So you know what stimuli can uh, provoke this. And four out of the five is really common sense. So let's start with the first one, the chemical stimuli. And this is where it comes in, why it is really important that there is no blood-brain barrier here. Because this area can directly sense whatever is in your blood. And if there are toxic things that are toxic for the body, uh, then uh, it, it uh, initiates uh, the getting rid of the toxic thing. So this is a, it's, it's a protective function that you can immediately get rid of something toxic. It can be also concentration dependent, like too much alcohol uh, leads to throwing up or uh, any drugs, any medicaments can make you throw up. Of course, individual, there are huge individual differences here. Or uh, uh, infection through the endotoxins of the bacteria, for example, or hormones, uh, pregnancy hormone. Everybody knows women in the first trimester of their pregnancy very often feel no, uh, nausea and throw up. Uh, this is the pregnancy hormone, the HCG, the human goriogonadotrop hormone. Then you could ask here, why is it good for the body? Because usually it's easy to understand all the others, that the body wants to get rid of it. But why is it good that the pregnant mother wants to throw up? Why is it good for the body? Um, it's a protective mechanism as well. You know that the first trimester of embryonic fetal life uh, uh, is the most sensitive uh, period for malformations by exogenous things. So uh, toxic things, anything. And many times women don't know that they are pregnant during the first few weeks or even first two months. A lot of women are not aware that they are pregnant. So the risk of eating something, taking some medicament, uh, that are toxic for the baby and can cause malformation is higher. And this is why uh, we have, uh, during the first trimester, this uh, constant um, nausea. So you don't want to eat anything. So you don't risk causing a malformation in the baby. That's the point. And let's see the next. Everybody knows. You sit on the roller coaster 
on the airplane, in the car, anything can make you throw up because of vestibular stimuli. The vestibular area is closed. You will soon learn it or you have already heard the cranial near nuclei is closed to this area. So vestibular stimuli. Then cortical stimuli, emotions, limbic system, visual, anything, anything disgusting, for example, can make you throw up. So this is, of course, individually very different. Uh, and the fourth, what you can know by common sense, uh, is the visceral uh, by the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves and the nucleus of the solitary tract, the pharynx reflex, or if you eat too much, the, 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 the stomach descends and this mechanical stimuli can make you throw up. The fifth is the one for which you need a little neuroanatomy, increased intracranial pressure. Very, very important that increased intracranial pressure can cause throwing up. Uh, this area lies on the floor of the fourth ventricle. So if the pressure there increases, it directly compresses actually these neurons. So these neurons can directly sense uh, this increased pressure, and this can be the first uh, symptom of a brain tumor, for example. So this can be a very important uh, thing. Okay, third main function, respiratory center. Respiratory center, you will hear a lot about this in, in uh, physiology when you learn exactly how our breathing is controlled. For us, it's enough if you know that in the pons, and in the medulla, we have the respiratory centers. In the medulla, the primary one with the inspiratory and expiratory zones, which work in alternate um, in inspiration and expiration, so alternately. And in the pons, we have a, a over center, but this center, the pneumotaxic uh, centers. The afferents, again, the main nerves, the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve, uh, carotid glomus, aortic body for oxygen and carbon dioxide partial pressure, and also, of course, from the cortex and brainstem, uh, you can control your breathing. The efferents and go to the breathing muscles, the inspiration expiratory muscles, and also to other muscles that take part, uh, larynx, for example, soft palate, facial expression, accessory muscles, etc. So uh, brainstem and spinal cord motor neurons. And this is the reticulospinal tract that I already mentioned. And this center regulates other reflexes that have to do with respiration, like sneezing and coughing as well. And there are a lot of clinical correlates. For example, uh, everybody has heard of sudden infant death syndrome. When a completely healthy baby is found dead in the crib, and these are always extreme tragedies because there was nothing wrong with the baby. It just simply did not breathe. And this is usually had uh, during the first life, first year of life. And uh, we still don't know what exactly the mechanism is. But one suggestion is that this alternate work of the inspiration, expiration, these centers, these reticular formation centers are not mature yet. And that's why this, this breathing control um, alarms are really useful because they can prevent uh, uh, this uh, uh, tragedy. Uh, it's also common in, in older ages, especially in, um, in overweight people, uh, central sleep apnea, which again is a problem in the breathing center, that it just, there are, there can be long periods when the patient is not breathing. And uh, this, of course, on long term causes hypoxic damage to the brain. And also everybody has heard of opiates causing depression of the respiratory center. And if, uh, you know, you, you hear that a drug addict was found dead, many times it's because simply did not breathe because the breathing center was uh, uh, was uh, depressed. So opi opioids, heroin, morphine, they cause, uh, if overdosed, um, depression of the respiratory center. Fourth is uh, the cardiovascular center. It's very similar to the 
respiratory center in the sense that in the sense that it is found in the medulla where we have again alternately working pressor and depressor centers that regulate blood pressure heart frequency of course increasing and decreasing it uh, respectively and uh, the afferents again the main uh, two nerves the glossopharynge and the vagus nerve so the main nucleus is the nucleus of the solitary tract and also hypothalamus as center of the autonomic functions and cortex limbic system. So, of course, you, you see your loved, uh, you, your, your secret love, um, or you see an examiner in the, in the corridor waiting for the exam, your heart starts beating faster. This is also uh, with this system. So, of course, the information in this case is coming from the cortex or the limbic system. And the efferents go to the originating neurons of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, so the vagus nucleus and uh, to the spinal cord, the reticulospinal tract. And after talking about the respiratory and the cardiovascular center, we have to mention the tonsillar herniation, which we actually already mentioned in the very beginning of your studies when you did the skull and you talked about the foramen magnum, I'm sure you all talked about the herniation. If there is increased intracranial pressure, if especially if it is in the posterior cranial fossa, like a cerebellar bleeding or cerebellar tumor, uh, then the cerebellum will be pushed towards the foramen magnum, which is the biggest hole in the area. And uh, the patient can die, not because the cerebellum will be compressed, but because the cerebellum will compress uh, here at this level, here you can see, we'll compress the medulla, and in the medulla we have the cardiovascular and the respiratory center. So it leads to respiratory and cardiac insufficiency, and it can lead to death. So this is a very important, it's a very dangerous, a life-threatening uh, situation. If the patient dies due to this herniation, you can see uh, the impression, the groove caused by the herniation in the uh, tonsilla, near the tonsilla. You can see actually the form of the foramen magnum, and it's called herniation groove. Uh, function number five is the motor function. This I already mentioned that the descending pathways of the spinal cord, the reticulospinal tract, and I said that it's a very important system, both from the medulla and the pons surrounding the anterior horn of the spinal cord uh, in regulating automatic movement. So uh, accompanying movements, muscle tone. So it's a very important motor uh, center with reflexes, tone activity, the uh, reticulospinal tract. A little bit more detailed, I would like to talk about pain. This is our last function that we will discuss today, pain. Uh, as a doctor, you will, of course, deal with pain a lot because that's the leading uh, symptom of patients, the leading problem that takes the patients to the doctor if something hurts. So uh, we already talked about pain in uh, regards to to this system, the spinal thalamic tract, that brings pain information to the cortex. I already mentioned that cortex is responsible for consciousness, awareness, and localization in this case. So we know it hurts, and we know where it hurts, because here in the somatosensory cortex, we have a body map, the homunculus, so we know exactly where it hurts, what happened. But you, you have all experience with pain. <clears throat> so you know that when, when you have sudden pain uh, or chronic pain, there are many other things happening in your body, many other feelings you have, many other things. Like uh, you can start sweating, you can vomit, um, you, you have uh, reactions, you're, you wake up, you, your whole body is alarmed, and this all has to do with the reticular formation. So here you have uh, the spinal reticular thalamic and the spinal reticular tract. This one ends in the reticular formation. 
and this one just goes through to the thalamus and be, uh, has collaterals in the reticular formation and spinal hypothalamic, which goes to the, through the reticular formation to the hypothalamus, which is the endocrine, limbic, and autonomic center uh, of the body. So this has to do with the emotions, the motivation, stress, alarmed reaction. Your body is alarmed, your cortex is alarmed, that you have to do something against it. So this, uh, all the autonomic responses, sweating, <clears throat> heart rate, uh, blood pressure changes, um, vomiting, all these accompanying reactions uh, uh, with, with emotions like babies start to, or, or children cry when they have pain, this, all these things are uh, not this pathway, but this other system with the reticular formation. And the third main direction of pain information is going to the mesencephalon, the spinal mesencephalic tract. And this is for pain suppression. So as you can see, this ends in this so-called periaqueductal gray matter or PAG, periaqueductal gray matter PAG or PAG, and uh, this is a very important uh, center for pain near the cerebral aqueduct. And that's why it's called periaqueductal. Uh, and so pain information reaches this center. And then in turn, there is a descending pathway from the periaqueductal gray matter first down to the rough, nucleus rough and magnus that I already mentioned at the beginning that it's important to remember this name, the nucleus rough and magnus. And from this nucleus, another descending tract, the rough spinal tract is uh, starting to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And Dr. Lubitsch already talked to you about um, this gate mechanism here. So this descending pathway will stimulate the interneurons that block this pathway. So going back, the spinal thalamic tract here, this is the responsible tract, the, the tract responsible for consciousness awareness. We know it hurts. If we blo block this neuron that brings the information to the cortex, we don't know about it. The source might be there, but we don't know about it. The source of pain is still there. But if we don't know about it, we don't, we don't uh, feel it. We don't know we feel it, right? It can still have all these other reactions, but we don't know, we are not aware, so we think it doesn't hurt. So this is a very important pain suppression pathway here if we can block this uh, neuron. So this is uh, very important. And uh, it's also important that all three levels of the system spinal cord, medulla, mesencephalon, uh, have opioid receptors. And you will, again, uh, uh, learn it very detailed in physiology and even more detailed in pharmacology, because of course these are all sites for uh, medicaments to interact. And also we have endogenous opioids, uh, which act on these um, endogenous opioid receptors. So we can also, uh, uh, release endogenous opiates which act on brain suppression and of course through medicaments. So this uh, you will you will uh, learn a lot more about this system. So how do these work together? You hit your finger, you withdraw your finger. This is not voluntary. This is a reflex, a spinal cord reflex that you learn the flex or reflex. This happens without knowing it. The spinal thalamic tract brings the information to the cortex, you are aware and you can localize your pain. Uh, all the other re uh, reactions, uh, uh, like the whole brain is alarmed, uh, accompanying autonomic reaction reflexes, this has to do with the reticular formation. Then the mesencephalic, the spinal mesencephalic, and the descending rough spinal tract is responsible for pain suppression. And one connection you haven't learned yet, but when you do the thalamus, uh, and cortex lectures, you will learn this, that there is a thalamus prefrontal cortex connection, which uh, decides how you, you individually feel about this. So you can say, it hurts, but I don't care. Or 
it hurts and and I have a hysteric attack. So this this connection is more responsible for how you really behave um, when you have pain. And of course, it's a very complex thing. So many other things regulate this. We can already uh, stimulate the, the the suppressing part of the uh, of the system, not only by drugs, but also by um, the so-called deep brain stimulation (DBS) by electrodes implanted near um, the dorsal horn, for example, you can suppress pain by stimulating these interneurons. Or endogenous opioids can be also released, uh, not only by meditation, but like uh, like um, uh, activity, body activity, uh, running, or any any kind of uh, physical activity actually releases. Uh, these opioids and can opiates and can uh, suppress pain. And then there are many other functions in the reticular formation. This group you already discussed when you did the eye movements, the horizontal and the vertical gaze centers. These are all parts of the reticular formation. And all these other reflexes that I mentioned, chewing, swallowing, etc., are also coordinated by the reticular formation. And now at the end, I play this song again, and you will understand, sorry, just my, from my computer, it doesn't work. So I have to open it with, um, from my phone. So everybody knows the song. And I always say to my students that, that in five years, if you are not neurologist or a neuroscientist, you won't remember the reticular formation functions. You won't remember the nucleus Ralph and Magnus, most of you at least. But if you, everybody knows this song. If you know, if, if you hear it, you will remember the most important functions of the reticular formation. I don't know if Sting knows about it, that he actually wrote the functions of the reticular formation. Uh, and just recently, a few weeks ago, I got a uh, messenger message from a student who was a student 10 years ago. And he sent me this song that he was just listening in the radio and he remembered the reticular formation. So this shows also that you, you, will, you will remember. Uh, so let's see uh, how this goes. Every function that I mentioned, every, the breathing center, every move you make, motor center, the reticular spinal tract, every bond you, it's, it's an association, a network, motor center, watching you, attention and eye movement, eye movement, day and night, the auras, the sleep rate cycle, again, connection with the cranial nerves, the limbic system, cortical connections, night, day, night, the sleep wake cycle, uh, eye movements, attention, consciousness. Here even two, heart and aches, so cardiovascular and pain. So listen to this song and summarize again the functions of the reticular formation. So with this, I, uh, I would like to thank you for the attention. And of course, if you have questions, uh, I'm here and happy to answer. Thank you.